Next.js server actions are incredibly powerful, but are rarely used to their full potential. Today, I'm going to show you how to level up your server actions in these five different ways. So first, we're going to make them fully type safe with automatic payload validation. We're going to consume them intuitively in our front end for both normal and optimistic updates. We're going to gracefully handle errors and notify users that something happened. Add all of this stuff as middleware. And finally, we're going to set up our code base to house hundreds of these different actions. Let's get to it. When you typically create a server action, it's going to look something like this, where we have an interface for our payload. We're going to have the actual function here in the use server file. We'll have our logic, and then we're going to consume it in the front end in some sort of on-click handler in a button or a form, right? But we're going to ditch this pattern entirely and instead use a library called Next Safe Action. What Next Safe Action is going to allow us to do is to easily create server actions and consume them more effectively. So let's take a look at that. Here we have our safe action client, which is going to be our entry point essentially when we create these actions. We're going to start with no config, but as we go throughout the video, we're going to add more stuff and it's going to get more complicated. Now let's check out how to actually create an action using this client. You'll immediately notice that we're using a Zod schema instead of a TypeScript interface and we're passing it into this dot schema call for the simple action client that we created. Within this action call, we're going to have our body where pretty much everything is going to remain unchanged, but we get this parsed input object which is going to have our payload. You'll notice that it's strongly typed and it's based on this Zod schema right here. Now that we've created this action, we're gonna consume it on the front end using this use action hook right here, which is exported from next safe action. We'll pass in this action as the first argument and then an optional config argument that has callbacks like on success, on error, and some other stuff we'll get into later. You'll see that this example better return lets us not only execute the action using this dot execute with the name, which is fully type safe, but it also allows us to see any errors that have occurred and then also the result. So just to demonstrate this, let's change our name right here and call the better action. As you can see, after a little bit, it updates because within this action, we also revalidate the path and we query Prisma to get that user object in the server component right here. If we want to have optimistic updates, we can instead use use optimistic action which has a very similar call signature to use action, except we're also passing this current state and also this update function. So because our example better action returns the Prisma user object, right? We can just merge this input's name with that object. And then that will optimistically update our UI and you'll see that it updates instantly instead of having a couple seconds of delay. So if we check this, you'll notice that this updates instantly. And then once the data actually returns, we can see that optimistic result. Now that we're defining and consuming our safe actions, we need to handle any errors that occur and let the user know that something happened. To do this, we have the on error callback, which you can pass into the config and both use action and use optimistic action. Here, we extract this error object and we can do something simple like log it or toast it. And just to show you how that looks, we can click this and we get that this is an error. If you figured out how you want to handle these errors on the front end and don't want to keep retyping the same code, you can just extract that into a different function. For instance, we have this on action error function, which takes in the error and then either toast it if it's a validation error, toast it if it's a server error, or provides a default server error message. If we also take a look at this example erroring action, you'll see that we're using a different action client. This is because we're adding the handle server error function in the config here. What this does is it looks for certain types of errors, such as Prisma errors or Zod errors, and then throws a specific error message based on that, because sometimes these error messages are actually pretty ugly. So for instance, if we go here and uncomment this line, which tries to parse one, two, three as a string, which is going to throw an error, you'll see that it throws this really ugly message where it says, you know, invalid type expected string. And ultimately your end user does not want to see that and it's going to confuse them. So if we go back in here and uncomment this section where we check if it's a Zod error and then go back click the error, it'll say an error occurred validating your input. And that is the same for Prisma right here. So if we uncomment this, comment out the Zod, go back, it'll say an error occurred with our database. And once again, if we uncomment this right here or comment this part out where we check for the Prisma error, you'll see that it's gonna show the database error message, which is extremely ugly and no one wants to see that. Now that our actions have a strong foundation, let's extend them with custom middleware that suits our needs. We're gonna start with authentication and authorization middleware. You'll see in this auth middleware example action, we're calling this dot use and we're passing in this middleware right here. So we're gonna start with authentication. You'll see that we use the create middleware function from next safe action, and then we define what the middleware actually does. In this case, we're just calling auth from next auth and then throwing an error if the user is not logged in. If the user is logged in, we pass in the session to the context, which I'll talk about more later. For the authorization middleware, we have this simple authorization middleware where we pass in what plans we want to allow to use this function as well as the roles. 
and we condition based on the session that we get. So you'll see now in this generic parameter that we're passing to create middleware, we define this context object which matches the context we passed in our authorization middleware, sorry, authentication middleware. Within the actual body, all we're doing is fetching this user from our Prisma database and then conditioning on their plan. So if plans does not equal all, we gotta make sure that the plans that we pass in as props matches one of the user's plans. And same thing for roles. Finally, we're gonna add this user object to the context. Now, in this action body, you'll see that both user and session are available in the context and it's fully type safe. So the reason this is possible is because this dot use call extracts the context from the return of these middlewares and then passes it to the actions. And so this makes everything fully type safe and it's just a great developer experience. Next, we're gonna cover logging and observability. So if we take a look at this logging middleware, which we call with use just like the other middlewares, we have this if statement where we check if we're in development right now. And if we are, we're just gonna log the input, result, and metadata of that function. Now, this is super useful if you just wanna have a greater idea of what's going on when you're building these functions. So if we click test observability here, you'll see that this is all logged to our console. On top of that, we have our Sentry middleware right here, which is configured to capture any errors that occur and then forward them to Sentry. So this uses the Sentry with server action instrumentation function. And if your project is set up with Sentry, you'll be able to see those errors in your Sentry dashboard. This project doesn't have it configured, but it's very simple to do if you have the correct environment variables set up. Now that we've added authentication and observability to our stack, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that these functions aren't abused and spammed by bad actors. So for that, we're gonna use our rate limiting middleware. If we go here, you'll see that we're using Upstash and their rate limit function here, which ties into their Redis database. And we will define a limiter, which says how many requests can we make per certain time period. So this is gonna be five requests per 10 seconds. And then we're gonna call this rate limit constructor. Then we're gonna get the IP of the current user using this X forwarded to header, which is what you get when you deploy your Next.js app to Vercel. And then we're gonna call this rate limit dot limit function. So if success is true, that means the user is not rate limited. And then this is gonna have the remaining calls they have for the window that we defined. So you'll see that if this isn't a success, we'll just throw an error, say too many requests. Otherwise, we're gonna forward it. So after five requests, assuming we don't go past the window, we're gonna get rate limited. So I had to compile a bit there, but now we get this too many requests toast because we have hit the rate limit. Finally, we're gonna add product analytics to our server actions. To start off, we're gonna take a look at this action client with meta, which is what we've been using for all of these middleware functions. You'll see that on top of the handle server error, we're gonna be defining this metadata called define metadata schema, right? And here we're gonna specify a name and then this track object, which is optional. In this name, we actually use this to decide if we're gonna rate limit a certain action. So if we go back here to this rate limit action and go into the body, you'll see that based on the name right here, we actually construct a string and that is how we decide whether to rate limit a function or not. And that stops these functions from colliding against another when we're rate limiting them. But back to the analytics action, we're gonna define this track here. And this is going to show up in our mixed panel dashboard, post hog, whatever we're using uh, once we call this analytics middleware. So looking at the body of this, it's very simple. We're gonna have to add both this session and then this metadata to the generic parameters when we call create middleware. Uh, and then we can just create our post hog client right here or mix panel, Google analytics, amplitude, whatever. And then we're gonna capture that event based on the track that event. And then also that user ID, which we get from the authentication middleware, which we call previously. So this does require the authentication middleware to be active. So if, as you can see, if we remove this, this is actually gonna throw an error because it knows that the uh, session object is not within the context, so it can't run it properly. So we've learned how to create these actions, consume them, handle errors, and also add middleware. The final thing we need to do is structure our repository so we can house potentially hundreds of these different actions. So I'd first recommend you create an actions folder at the root where all your actions related items are gonna go. And also whenever you create a server action, just prefix it in actions.ts right here, just for clarity. Also, instead of putting your Zod schema for each action within its own file, I'd recommend you have a schema.ts file that you have at the root where all of your server action inputs are gonna go. Now, the reason we do this is because sometimes you're gonna to wanna to consume that Zod schema on your front end. For instance, if you are using React form and you want to validate on that input. If you put it in the server action file, because it's a server only file, you're not gonna be able to access it from the client and it's gonna throw an error. So that's why you wanna keep them all here. Grouping your actions by feature category is also pretty helpful and is gonna reduce the visual clutter. So for instance, if we have these authentication related actions, we'll put them all in auth. 
you know, if we're writing a feature for creating documents, maybe we have a documents folder, but you just want to group all related actions together and reduce visual clutter. Also, instead of adding middleware to every single action we create, we can just create new action clients and consume them like that. So as you can see, this no auth action client has logging, rate limiting, and sentry, and we consume it here and sign in, right? So now we don't have to define the middleware anywhere. We just have to define the metadata and then the schema. If we go back and check our auth action client right here, you'll see it has the logging, rate limiting, authentication, authorization, analytics, and observability. And we consume it in our sign out action and we don't have to specify any of that there. On top of that, I've added a couple more complex things such as defining our rate limiter within the metadata. So we can actually pass in different windows and tokens per function. So for instance, if you want to rate limit logins, you know, to maybe two times a minute, you can add that there. And we also have this more complex authorization middleware, which uses generics to actually uh, infer the types of the return and the context that it creates. So I'm not going to get too much into this, but the repository is going to be in the description. So if you're interested, definitely check it out because it is more production grade and definitely more complex. And that's it. So I hope you learned something about server actions today. Maybe you'll be using NextSafe Action in your next project. Let me know in the comments below what you found the most interesting and subscribe if you want to see more Next.js content and web development content. Peace.